Welcome back to another update video for Portal 64. I'm really excited to be back working on Portal. Um, I had a lot of fun working in the game jam. I think the game we made sticks turned out great, uh, but I was ready to jump right back into this project and I've, I think I've made some pretty good progress. So for starters, Chell is finally in the game and uh, I couldn't be happier with the result. Um, there is a part in the opening part of the game, uh, the game designers knew what they were doing when they designed the first test chamber. When you start in your little cage at the start of the game, the portal opens and you see yourself right away. And when you move, you see yourself move through the portal. And that just reinforces the idea that you know, you're looking through a portal at yourself. And that just wouldn't really be possible without seeing your player character. So having Chell in the game really completes that effect. And so I also spent some time working on the animation system. So I already had an animation system from a previous game I worked on last year. Well, no. Yeah, last year. And so it, it, it worked pretty well, except it it relied on keyframe animation. So if I wanted to start an animation halfway through, it just really wouldn't let me. And um, blending animations uh, came, with, came with its own challenges. And the system itself was just a lot more complicated because I had to store animations encoded using keyframes. And it just, it made things a lot more complicated. And there's a... There's a principle in software development or just engineering in general called, you know, KISS or keep it simple, stupid, um, which just basically means simpler solutions are usually better. And with the previous animation system, I was trying to optimize for memory. So like the animation was as small as possible, so it wouldn't use as much space on the cart and it would stream faster from the cartridge. But I did the math and uh, to do the animation uncompressed, you know, just having the full frame transferred every time I need a new frame is only about like 134 bytes per frame, which really isn't that much. And N64 can handle that no problem. Um, so I'm, so I think that was a case of premature optimization. I should not have tried to optimize for memory. I should have just done the simple one first and it works great. And I'm able to do animation blending and I'll even be able to do things like play animations backwards or you know, start playing in the middle or lots of other things that I probably won't even need to do for this project, but you know, I'll have the option moving forward. So I've realized that I've never actually explained how you make a Nintendo 64 game today. Um, well, first of all, I use modern SDK, which is a port of the tools that you compile and build a ROM to Linux. So you don't even need to be using an old operating system because before before modern SDK, you had to boot a virtual machine with Windows XP and that was a pain to, to deal with. But when you have Linux, um, you can include a lot of modern tools to go alongside with it and just, it just it's a much better system. Um, but then, you know, that's how you are able to write software and compile it to run on Nintendo 64. But how do you actually load a cartridge onto the Nintendo 64? Well, I use an EverDrive. Uh, this one's the EverDrive X7 model, which has a USB port on it, and that is critical for what I need. Without it, I really this this project would not be possible. Um, what the USB port allows me to do is to transfer data from the N64 to my computer while the game is running. So I can use that to you know output information as needed, but I also use that to connect a debugger to the Nintendo 64. So I can pause the execution of the code at any point and inspect values. And uh, the, after I've verified things or debugged things, I can resume running. And uh, that's been pretty much essential for this project and wouldn't be possible without this. Well, um, I actually reached out to EverDrive and this copy here, this is an extra copy and I don't need it, which is why I'm gonna give it away to one of you. So if you're interested in receiving the copy of this EverDrive, just comment below with, uh, with the word EverDrive in your comment, and I'll pick somebody in the comment section to uh, receive a free copy of the EverDrive. Um, but I would highly, highly recommend that you get one of these, even if you're not into Nintendo 64 development. If you're just interested in playing Nintendo 64 games, you can fit an entire library of games on an SD card that goes into that one drive and that's your entire library. Um, not only can you have your entire library of games in one cart, but you can also load up ROM hacks and uh, Portal 64 in this case. So if you wanted to play Portal 64 on real hardware, EverDrive is the way to go. I'll put a link in the description below to their store 
um, and feel free to have a browse. They, they sell a lot more than just Nintendo 64 drives. They do it for a variety of consoles. They're very high quality. I've had no problems with game compatibility. It's just, it's a great way to go. Um, so I'm very grateful to EverDrive that they gave me a free copy to give to one of you. So anyway, on to the rest of the video. So I implied that it was pretty much impossible to optimize Chell's Mesh. So what does that mean? To understand how to optimize a mesh or character model, you first need to understand how they are drawn. Before drawing a face, the N64 first needs to configure how the face is transformed and what material and image will be used on that face. To control the transform, an armature is used. An armature is a collection of bones that can move, rotate, and scale. The bones can be set up in a hierarchy, so parent bones also transform children bones. This allows the upper arm to move the entire arm, but the lower arm bone only moves the lower arm. To control the material, the RDP needs to be configured, which is the piece of hardware responsible for drawing pixels to the screen. The most time-consuming part of material switching is loading the image that will be drawn for the given material. Once the correct transform is derived from the armature and the correct material has been set up, any faces using that pair of bone and material can be drawn. Once they are done, another chunk of faces that uses a different pair of bones and materials are drawn. An analogy you can use to help understand the process is a traveling salesman. So a traveling salesman wants to visit a number of cities selling product at each city. To make the most efficient use of his time, he wants to find the shortest path possible that visits every city. Using this analogy, a city is a pairing of a bone and a material. The distance between the cities is the time it takes to transition from one state to another. Or more specifically, how long it takes to apply new transformations and swap out textures in the RDP memory. So, if we can solve the traveling salesman problem, then we can find the optimal order to draw all of the components of any character model. So on the surface, it may not seem like it's that big of a problem, but this is one of the hardest problems in computer science, and it's still not really solved in a general case. So you might be thinking, okay, why not just try every possible combination? Well, um, if you did that, you know, you start, you have to pick a starting point and then you say, okay, well, I'm going to try every possible city that I visit first. And then after that, you have one less city to visit. You check every possible city of the remaining cities. Um, it turns out that that algorithm um, takes about n factorial time with respect to the number of cities. So factorial just grows super fast. Um, it's not plausible once you get even like up to like 20 or more cities. It's, it's pretty, it gets ridiculous really fast. And that's brute force. There are a few ways to improve it, but there's no way to really do this with a large number of cities um, e efficiently. And even, even super modern supercomputers couldn't really do this for, for a large number of cities. And it's, it's, and that's the problem that I have to solve if I want to to optimize these meshes perfectly. So what can be done? Well, I don't need to know for sure that I have the best solution. I just need a good enough solution. And so I just did, a, it's called a greedy approach where I just find the shortest distance or the shortest time to each state from the beginning. So I, can, so I start at the starting state. What's the shortest time to the next state? I go to that one first, draw that. And then once I'm there, okay, what's the next closest state? and repeat that. And then once I'm there, I say, okay, what's the next closest state? And then after that, I go to the next closest state after that. So that's a greedy algorithm for this. And you know, it does a decent job, but it's not actually a guarantee that you'll have the fastest uh, loop. Um, so if you imagine, if you look at this configuration of points where it has like that zigzag, well, the closest point at any point is across the way and down the line. Um, so if you always do the greedy algorithm, you'll just zigzag back and forth where if in order to do this loop, the, the shortest way, you're much better off just going in a straight line across and then coming al along on the way back to the top. Um, and so that's, that's one case where the greedy algorithm fails here. And there are various other cases. There's no way to guarantee it. So I think that's pretty much all I have for this video today. Um, yeah, I think I'll probably be right back on to adding more test chambers now coming up now that I've gotten one of the big pieces of work out of the way that I wanted to do, which is get Chell in the game. So yeah, um, see you next time.